hello again, U.S. history students. It's your boy, Mr. Northrup, and I'm back with another unit recap. Another one. Now, last video, I was wearing a Braves hat, and this time I'm rocking my hat from the high school baseball team I coached in Grand Island, Nebraska. Quick shout out to my Islanders. So I guess you could say this is a new cap for the recap. Our second unit covers the Gilded Age, which refers to the period following Reconstruction, when the American economy grew at its fastest rate in history. This was a period of transformation in the economy, technology, government, and social customs of America. This transformation forged a modern national industrial society out of what had previously been small regional communities. But how did this era get its name? Well, first we need to find out what the word means. Gilding refers to to the process of coating cheap metals with a thin layer of gold. Now that doesn't sound like it fits very well. What you talking about, but during this era, America became more prosperous and saw unprecedented growth in industry and technology. But there was a more sinister side. It was a period where greedy, corrupt industrialists, bankers, and politicians enjoyed extraordinary wealth and opulence at the expense of the working class. In fact, it was wealthy tycoons, not politicians, who inconspicuously held the most political power during the Gilded Age. All right, so there's a lot of information covered within this unit. So I recommend watching it maybe a couple of times, possibly from a few different devices. And I promise that this has nothing to do with the fact that I want you guys to help me get YouTube or TikTok famous. But wouldn't it be really cool if your US history teacher got YouTube or TikTok famous? I'm just saying. But that's not why we're here. Let's start with the American frontier, the lines separating settlement areas from those less densely populated. Now, by the end of the Civil War, this frontier consisted of the Great Plains, Rocky Mountains, and Southwestern deserts. Now, using push-pull factors to explain human migration, the great move west in this country can be explained by the push of economic hardships and the pull of economic opportunity. Now, people traveled to the American West to find new economic opportunities. Miners journeyed in droves with hopes of striking it rich due to recent discoveries of gold and silver. Others hoped to establish their own farms and ranches. It was the completion of the Transcontinental Railroad in 1869 and the availability of cheap land under a government program as part of the Homestead Act that encouraged this mass migration. Following the Indian Removal Act of 1830 that authorized the forced withdrawal of numerous Indian tribes from the southeast, the Great Plains and Southwest became home to many natives. The Indian Appropriations Act of 1851 established reservations in the territories that would become the states of Oklahoma, Nebraska, and Kansas. Inspired by the ideology of Manifest Destiny, which held that European Americans were divinely ordained to settle the whole of the North American continent, settlers pushed ever further westward towards the Pacific. As they did so, they increasingly came into violent conflict with Native Americans over land and natural resources. As settlers continued to move into the Great Plains region, they battled the Plains Indians tribes in a series of conflicts known as the Sioux Wars, which lasted from 1854 to 1890. Although both sides won battles during this time, the tribes were eventually forced onto small pockets of land that were often undesirable. Many of the promises made to native leaders were broken once it became clear the settlers had control. Regions of the American West often went through different stages. Some places were first dominated by mining or cattle grazing. Later, farmers and ranchers took over. Farmers developed new technologies to farm on the dry but fertile Great Plains. They dug wells and built windmills to pump water found deep in the ground. They built sod houses and surrounded their fields with barbed wire to keep livestock in and the other animals out. They used steel plows to break up the tough sod and made Made greater use of farm machinery. In 1887, Congress passed the Dawes Act. Now, this act was a thinly veiled attempt to help the natives. It gave them the right to create private property from reservation land and tried to Americanize them. However, the Dawes Act was a failure because it lacked respect for Indian traditions and it led to a massive sell-off of Indian lands. 
Now, in the decades following the Civil War, Americans experienced a second industrial revolution. The first industrial revolution, which was 70 years earlier, had been based on the use of the steam engine and the new factory system. The second industrial revolution witnessed the expansion of the railways, increased production of steel, the introduction of telecommunications and electricity, and the emergence of a truly national market. And many factors prepared the way for America's second industrial Industrial Revolution. The United States possessed abundant natural resources, including water, timber, coal, iron ore, and oil, and a growing population provided labor. The free enterprise system, coupled with the American work ethic, encouraged individual initiative, entrepreneurship, and economic growth. All the while, the government provided a system of laws, established patents and copyrights, regulated the currency, sold public lands, and established tariffs that were favorable to growth. And new inventions helped to trigger this new industrial revolution. These included the Bessemer process for making steel, the sewing machine, telegraph, telephone, electric light bulb, typewriter, elevator, refrigerated railway car, and the cash register. Following a shift in leading ideology, African-American men and women contributed to a steady stream of new inventions as well. Among them were folks such as Madam Walker, Elijah McCoy, Sarah Good, John Burr, Lewis Howard Latimer, Jan Ernst Matzeliger, Sarah Boone, and Garrett Morgan. The expansion of the railroads and new methods of communication created a truly national market. With this, Americans developed new ways to sell and distribute goods, such as the department store and mail order catalog. A new forms of doing business, such as the corporation, made it easier to raise the huge sums of money required by heavy industry. Large enterprises enjoyed certain economies of scale. They could purchase large quantities of goods at a discount or even acquire their own sources of supply. They could design larger production facilities and take full advantage of mechanization and the latest technologies. The entrepreneurs who built these enterprises, among them Andrew Carnegie in steel, John D. Rockefeller in oil, and J.P. Morgan in electricity, banking, and steel amassed immense personal fortunes. Many of the richest gave part of their fortunes away through acts of philanthropy. We refer to them as captains of industry. However, they could also engage in cutthroat practices against competitors and equally harsh tactics against their own workers. These individuals are known as robber barons. The federal government attempted to prevent some of the worst abuses of big business through legislation. The Interstate Commerce Act in 1887 prevented unfair practices by railroads. The Sherman Antitrust Act in 1890 allowed the government to break up monopolies that engaged in harmful business practices against the public interest. Just as I mentioned earlier, there is another side to the coin. America's second industrial revolution led to worsening conditions for many of the industrial workers in the North. They labored in unpleasant or dangerous conditions for long hours at monotonous and repetitive jobs and received super low wages for their troubles. Much of this was because individual workers had no bargaining power with the mighty corporation. Some workers began to organize into groups groups known as labor unions to improve their conditions. Through these unions, they could negotiate wages and working conditions collectively with their employers. If those negotiations fell through or hit a snag, union members could also go on strike. Two examples of early national unions were the Knights of Labor and the American Federation of Labor. While both groups initially limited membership to skilled workers and shared goals of shorter work days and better working conditions, the Knights of Labor eventually invited unskilled workers to join and maintained a stance against strikes. Their undoing occurred following an 1886 riot in Chicago's Haymarket Square, wherein 11 people lost their lives as part of a labor demonstration. Now, it was after the decline of the Knights of Labor that the American Federation of Labor gained popularity. Focusing on wages and conditions, the AFL avoided partisan politics, going so far as to structure their constitution to prevent the admission of political parties as affiliates. They adopted a philosophy of business unionism, which emphasized the contribution to profit and national economic growth. 
However, management had many advantages over labor unions in the late 19th century. Government leaders and the public generally sympathized with management and were suspicious of labor unions. Management could either fire or lock workers out, as well as blacklist union leaders and even obtain government support to put down strikes. Now, that's not to say that the earliest major strikes were all that successful anyway. While union organizers were blamed for the aforementioned Haymarket Square riot, it, a large group of steel workers striking against Carnegie's Homestead Steel Mill were defeated when the state militia intervened. And finally, in a rare instance of federal involvement, President Cleveland used federal troops to break up the Pullman Strike, a widespread railroad strike and boycott that effectively halted rail traffic and commerce in 27 states stretching from Chicago to the West Coast. The Gilded Age saw several new economic and philosophical ideologies emerge in response to the Industrial Revolution. Capitalists, especially those who had experienced massive success under relaxed government regulation, continued to support laissez-faire policies. Along those same lines, social Darwinists thought that the wealthy at the top of society were simply superior to others. Communists predicted a violent proletarian revolution would overthrow the wealthy and create a more just just an egalitarian society in which property was held in common. Socialists also desired social change, but sought to achieve this through peaceful means. Anarchists opposed all forms of organized government. Now, the rapid rise of industry led to urbanization, which is the movement of people from the countryside to cities. However, the growth of cities caused many new problems, including traffic congestion, overcrowding in slums, inadequate garbage collection and sewage treatment, and vast differences in wealth. These problems in cities led to the rise of political machines. One of the more famous political machines at the time was Tammany Hall. The machine, usually led by a boss, provided services to immigrants and the poor. Once services were rendered, the machine would encourage immigrants and the poor to vote for its candidates. Officials elected by the machine made huge fortunes by charging excessive amounts on public contracts or receiving kickbacks. Before 1880, most immigrants had come from Great Britain, Ireland, and Germany. The new immigrants, as they were called, came from Southern and Eastern Europe after 1880. Most were Catholic, Jewish, or Greek Orthodox. Many spoke no English and were desperately poor. But steamship companies made coming to America way more affordable. Poorer immigrants traveled steerage class, where conditions varied from ship to ship, but it was normally crowded, dark, and damp. Limited sanitation and stormy seas often combined to make it dirty and foul-smelling. Rats, insects, and disease were common problems for the passengers in these areas of the ship. European immigrants were processed at Ellis Island, where they could be sent back if they did not pass a medical examination. After 1910, Asians were processed on Angel Island in San Francisco Bay, where they often faced long delays. Most immigrants went to live in ethnic neighborhoods in cities known as ghettos, where they lived with others speaking the same language and practicing the same traditions. Usually the children of immigrants were the first to be Americanized. Let's pedal back to the Asian immigrants who were processed at Angel Island for just a moment. These folks faced special challenges not seen on the other side of the country. Now, overall, almost everyone who came through the East's Ellis Island, roughly 98%, was admitted. By contrast, 60% of the immigrants who arrived at Angel Island, most of whom were Chinese, were detained and it took weeks or months to be released. A Chinese men began arriving after the California Gold Rush and helped to build the railroads in California. But the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882 banned almost all immigrants from China. The Japanese Americans began arriving at the end of the century and their immigration was restricted by the Gentlemen's Agreement of 1907 between Japan and the United States. The Navy Nativists believed that white Protestant native-born Americans were superior to others and that immigrants with other cultural traits were undesirable. This caused many issues in the West. 
In the late 19th century, most Americans were still farmers. They began experiencing difficulties when food prices fell, even though their costs remained high. Farmers organized into social and political groups to meet these challenges. The Grange Movement was a national association of farmers' social clubs, which served social and educational purposes. Grangers entered state legislatures and passed laws to regulate grain elevators and railroads. The Supreme Court upheld state regulation of a grain elevator in a case called Munn v. Illinois in 1887. It overruled a state law regulating railroad rates in Wabash v. Illinois in 1886 on the grounds that only Congress could regulate interstate commerce. And Congress passed the Interstate Commerce Act in 1887, which was the first federal law to regulate business practices. Now, the Populist Party was formed in the early 1890s to represent the interests of farmers and workers. The Omaha Platform of 1892 included many far-reaching proposals that were later adopted, such as the direct election of U.S. Senators, a progressive income tax, the eight-hour workday, and restrictions on immigration. In 1896, William Jennings Bryan was chosen as the Democratic and Populist candidate for president after giving his Cross of Gold speech. Now, in his campaign, Brian focused on bimetallism, the proposal to base money on silver as well as gold in order to raise prices. Brian ultimately lost the election to William McKinley in a close contest. Ushering us out of the 1800s, a chain reaction of failed companies set off an economic depression unlike anything seen before in America. The banks soon followed suit, and this resulted in a stock market crash with ripple effects that left millions unemployed and homeless. This nearly five-year-long depression was a direct result of the rampant political corruption and blatant social inequality of the Gilded Age. Now, as we'll learn in our next video, Americans' frustrations led to the election of Theodore Teddy Roosevelt and the beginning of the Progressive Era. I'll see you there.